and Noel Dalton. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. You're welcome. Um, we're talking about the Clyde Shipping Company and for anybody over 30 years of age uh, in Waterford, Clyde Shipping Company was uh, an institution. Actually, it, it was very busy. It helped uh, a, a, a very extensive trade with uh, England and Scotland and uh, Wales and, and the continent. Uh, the Clyde, as you probably realise, was founded in Scotland. It was founded in 1815. And uh, it's 200 years, uh, as I say, this, this year. And in point of fact, it's 60 years since I joined the service. Um, in the early days, uh, the ships were, they had two ships, the Industry and Trusty. And they went from Glasgow to Greenock with, with passengers. But they bought a, a ship uh, in uh, 1815 called uh, the Vivandier and they sailed her to Cork and Waterford. And that was the first link with Waterford uh, that uh, the Clyde Shipping Company had. Um, from, from then on, it, it, uh, it uh, cemented its, its uh, sorry, uh, missed. Uh, from then on, it cemented it, its attachment to Waterford. And over the years, it improved the services. Uh, and um, coming from Glasgow to Waterford. Uh, they then, in the late 1800s, uh, they bought out a declining Malcolmson's uh, sh shipping. Uh, these were the great people of Waterford, in point of fact, the great people of the British Empire at, at, at the time in shipping, probably the biggest shippers in the world. Uh, they ship, had ships going in the 1800s from uh, Galway to New York, and. They owned cotton mills and Port Law was their big thing, but they built 33 ships between 1860 and 1890, and 13 of those were built in Waterford, in, in their shipyard in Waterford. But they had family discord and uh, they lost a lot of money in the uh, American Revolution. They were on the southern side sympathising, so uh, their ship, they declined and Eventually, in 1812, the uh, Clyde Shipping Company bought out their interests in Waterford, and uh, this was uh, a small addition to them, but they wanted to get into Liverpool. Clyde never had a, a port in Liverpool until then for themselves, so they, they got into Liverpool on that, and uh, they took over uh, three ships from uh, the old Malcolmsons. And uh, one of them uh, was called uh, the. Sorry, I have to stop now for a minute. Uh, yeah, Yeah, they, 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 they took over three ships uh, on that purchase in 1912, the Dunbrody, the Cloda and the Reginald. And they also took over a cattle yard in Rose Lane, the snow of the car park for the Tower Hotel. And uh, there was a, a lane down where the Tower Hotel actually stands now and called Tower Lane or Tower Street. And that gave, gave you uh, admittance to their cattle yard. So they took those over. And uh, already they had taken the decision that they would call all their ships after light houses or light vessels, the oil company. And uh, like you have the Tusker for the Tusker Rock, the Fastnet for off Cork, the Conning Bay was off uh, Wexford, the light ship, uh, the Arclo, light ship was Arclo Bank, and so on. The Rockabilly then was up North County Dublin and went right up to Glasgow for the Plada and the, and, and the Sander. So they called all their ships after lighthouses and uh, they uh, renamed then the Cloda the uh, Conningbeg. Uh, and this was uh, an eventful moment which they didn't realise because the Con uh, the Conning Bay 
and, the, and they built the Formby in 1914, and the two of them were on the wharf at Liverpool Run. Uh, but on the 15th of December, the two of them were in Liverpool Harbour. Uh, they were making the last voyages before they came home for Christmas. And um, the uh, Formby sailed uh, uh, Captain Minards, who they took over from uh, the old Waterford Steamship Company that belonged to the Malcolmsons. And uh, uh, the other uh, captain uh, also from the, uh, the Formby was a, a, a Waterford man, uh, Captain Lumley. So those two captains were in uh, Liverpool on that 17th of December, uh, getting ready to sail for Waterford. And uh, there was a, a rumour out that there was some submarines in the Irish Sea at the time, it was during the 1914-18 war. And uh, he, he sailed anyway, but there was a, a, a great, um, the height of the German U-boat power in the First World War was during 1917 and uh, a master left Germany going to the southwest approaches to block off uh, supplies for Great Britain uh, uh, and uh, he sailed for it but he had a narrow escape uh, in the English Channel some months beforehand and uh, the weather was bad and he was a little bit off course so he decided that he wouldn't go through the channel but he'd go right up over Scotland and come down into the Irish Sea, which he, he did. And he was lying off the, the, the Anglesey at the time and uh, the Formby sailed and of course that evening at 8 o'clock with one torpedo he demolished the whole boat and crew and passengers, they were all lost. Now, the, that was Saturday morning. On Sunday morning, there was a bit of agitation in water, but the ship hadn't turned up. But there was a big gale blew up and it blew across Waterford, uh, across the Irish Sea, into Britain. And it put down all the telephone wires. And they couldn't contact Liverpool to know had the ship sailed. So that they didn't know anything about it. And uh, with that, the Formby sailed, uh, the Conningbeg sailed. And he went to his doom too, just uh, a day afterwards. So the, the two of them were lost, and there wasn't anybody found. No survivors were found of either ship. And there was 44 on one, I think 49 on another. And uh, they were lost without trace. The only thing was uh, the stewardess's uh, sacred heart badge that she had pinned on her, 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 her clothes. Uh, was found with her name on it, and that was, that was the only thing. So there was terrible grieving in Waterford, and for years afterwards, they had no bodies to remember or anything like that. And uh, it was eventually under Captain Lumley's daughter, Rainy Lumley, who made an effort uh, to have them remembered. And you might see two uh, bow those of ships in granite down there opposite the Tower Hotel. They were erected uh, in, uh, I think it was 1998, and Captain, uh, President Mary Robinson came down and uh, she unveiled that memorial in water. So that stands now forever to the Clyde Shipping Company. Uh, also, uh, there were, at that time, the, uh, the rebellion broke out in Dublin course and it was put down and uh, we were given the 26 counties free state so that made made big differences then because the old flag ship of the company was a Sky, Scottish line over an Irish harp in two pence and that was done away with then so the new one was uh, a pennant also a, a dark blue background with a white lighthouse and a rope acting as a rock around it. So uh, it, it had repercussions. Uh, custom sheds had to be uh, here, had to be erected on the quay to use free, uh, to, you know, uh, taking duty for the goods because all other goods were out in the open until, uh, until then. There were tarpaulins over them, right down to Regiment's Tower and up to the Clock Tower. 
and horses and rails came along and backed into them and they got their goods. So uh, it was involved in there. So when we did get our freedom, as everybody knows, you know, we had the Civil War. And uh, in 1922, the uh, anti-treaty forces were holed up in the GPO and the pro-treaty forces came down to, uh, across to uh, near the golf course and put up a, a, a gun there, a heavy artillery gun, and showered the city there, the barracks in uh, Barrack Street, in Green Street there, area was hit. And uh, the GPO was under fire too, where the, where the Republicans were, and all the windows were shattered. Uh, so uh, there was one ship on the berth at the time, but he eased himself off of it and raised enough steam to go down, down the river. Uh, the, the, all the bag stuffs in the Clyde store, the red building above, just next to the GPO, uh, were commandeered by the Republicans and set up as, uh, uh, what would they say, to, to give them shelter from bullets coming in windows and that. But all the windows were shattered. But when I joined the club, at the, in 1955, they had a beautiful double dished counter. It was just waved, and you could write it from the outside on a raise, and also, if you were a clerk there talking, taking notes, you could write from the inside on it. Beautiful uh, thing. But there was one chunk out of it, and uh, I, I wondered what it was, and I asked somebody, it was slightly different colour. And that's what say some bullets ripped through the, the counter during the siege of Waterford. So, you know, it's it's rolled up in history as well, the, the slide chipping of, of Waterford. And um, it's uh, continued on. And the most endearing ship, I suppose, to Waterford was the Rockaby. It was built in, in 1936 and it kept on the, the trade until the, the early 60s when it closed down. And with it went the last passenger ship uh, co uh, coming into Waterford. You know, and I mean passenger, uh, passenger service, that was a regular twice a week Waterford Liverpool or that, just not an odd passenger ship like you have the big ships coming in now with the, the tourists. So um, when, uh, when that closed, it ran all the time and it never stopped during the Second World War except it was requisitioned for a while in uh, 1944. And, uh, but it, it was back on uh, again uh, shor shortly after. But there was one time uh, in 1944 that the service didn't run for two months between May and uh, June. And uh, the reason for that uh, <coughs> was that the highly uh, secretive uh, preparation for D-Day was in, uh, was in plan in Britain and uh, there was no movement allowed on the Irish Sea until they had secured their places in Normandy and then the services uh, continued again. So uh, that, uh, that finished then and uh, with the Rockabill was the last, uh, the last ship uh, that had the service into war for British Rails, Great Western had, had stopped a year or two before that. And uh, I think that was a decline, start of the real decline of Waterford Port. Uh, it, it was never quite as busy with ships. Yes, there were larger ships, all right, and that um, inevitably led to the port going downriver because with the larger ships, you're getting deeper drafts. And uh, there are two uh, obstacles uh, in um, at Duncannon and uh, Cheap point, so uh, ships uh, of great size couldn't come up anymore, and um, that's why it was fine. But it's gone down, it's far as well view now, and uh, still some ships can't get up past passage. I don't know, but big ships still can't get up because there's deep water down just at Bel um, Bellevue Port. So um, that was that. Uh, after that, in 1956, the Clyde Shipping held a great gala dinner in the Grand Hotel Tremor for all their staff. It was, uh, it was uh, full dress and it was like old colonial. They brought over uh, director John Humphrey from uh, Glasgow for it. And uh, we were all lined up outside the door. Little Bell went and the Master of Ceremonies 
introduced your name and your partner's name and you went inside the door and the, the, the board man and his wife were stood inside and they greeted you and went to your allotted place. But 1956 was uh, what was the beginning of the end for the, for the clay chipping company because when the uh, uh, Rockabilly was eventually uh, went to, to uh, the Breakers Yard in 1964, I think. Um, it, the Clyde had no ships of their own then. Everything was uh, done on a charter basis. And Steve Doring was big. But then there were, there were some good days after that. Uh, they joined with Bell Lines and Coastlines then in 1970 to run a new unitized service. It was the beginning of flats and containers the very first of them and they they came from Preston into Waterford and there was a, a trolley to bring them down that they were lined up on the quayside from where the Ulster Bank is now right up to the clock tower and a trolley crane brought them down to the big crane and uh, they, they loaded them from there into, into vessels but after four years the Clyde sold out their shares they thought it wasn't the way of the future. Unfortunately, they were wrong, and their staff knew they were wrong. But that was it. So uh, it was compensated for the 1970s and 80s by a huge opening in cattle markets uh, across Europe and uh, into the Soviet Union and North Africa. And we had ships every day of the week loading hay and straw. And that and that 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 went on up into the 1960s. But the company was diluting it was going in with uh, uh, main port transport. I think it was in Cork and uh, Park. But eventually, by the 80s, water was in a bad state. 1979, 20,000 people walked the streets of water in protest about working. That there was no work for them. People were leaving the country in droves. And uh, after that, uh, Clover Meats closed down, the chipboard uh, factory in Waterford closed down, Miloco and Carrick closed down. All the industries that were supplying uh, uh, Waterford closed down, so the place was in a bad way. We had the Sando coming from Glasgow to Dublin to Waterford and to Cork uh, before the, the Rockabilly with Demise and uh, that used to bring all the porter from, from Guinness in Dublin to Waterford. There was no uh, road uh, tankers or anything like that in those days. So it all came by boat and it was uh, loaded uh, in, in Dublin and discharged here. Uh, there was one good uh, funny thing was packets had a college business by Horse and Dre and uh, they used to come in and there was a famous driver for them, Ned Q. Uh, he'd come down in the morning and he wanted his, he had hogsheads, barrels, firkins, they were all different sizes of casks uh, there and he wanted all his out as fine as possible and he wouldn't be in the best of humour. But he'd go around to each of the pubs and the bottlers of Waterford and after he come back from each one, uh, I think that uh, he gets a, better, a little bit better humour. He'd be <laughs> humour. So at the end of the day, he was in great humour with everybody, and I think the, the horse knew the way home then. <laughs> so that was one of the, you know, the, the characters in Water, the uh, a, fine, a fine man. Uh, that, but uh, in 1986, uh, they, they they closed their doors, and. Uh, it was a big blow to Waterford because at their height they were running four or five ships a week to two of them to Liverpool, more of them to Southampton, to London, to Dublin, to Glasgow and all and there was big gangs of dockers. Everything that was done then was done without mechanisation like uh, the ship's cranes dropped them, there were, there were steam cranes dropped them on the line, and big heavy trucks to take three men there, they say bag stuff, they would land them on the truck and when they get between two braced uh, wooden handles to, to lift it and the other two would push 
into a shed there uh, on the quay. So uh, that was the end of, uh, of the Clyde Shipping Company. But it, it made a great contribution to the economy of Waterford, not only Waterford, but all the surrounding areas of both South Kilkenny and East Waterford, uh, because the hay had to be bought to feed the, the cattle on route. And they got that done in the cattle yard and uh, they bought it and uh, stuck it in there. And uh, you had uh, taxis bringing, going to Dublin Airport with changes of crew and things like that. And of course, the, after the war, then cars began to appear on the road again. And uh, then the car carriers came. So water was too far, if you like, for, for a small port. And uh, it declined, and uh, certainly Dublin took over almost all of it, and Cork then more the second best, and there is the to service the Cork and the southwest of the country, and all that line. So it was a sad day in, in uh, 1956 when it closed its doors for the last time. So I hope that's. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? No, 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 because I tell you, I couldn't see my notes and I left a lot of stuff out. <laughs> when, um, when did you start working? I started in 1955. Uh, I came out of Del Salle College and it was a prestigious job then. There was uh, advertisements on the paper and you applied and there was an exam in the us and then there was an interview. And the, the winner was picked. Uh, I was lucky to be picked once, but well, as as the, uh, the the vacancies are arose, uh, that, that was the way it was done. But uh, the side and British Railways uh, were, were the ESB were probably the three you know best jobs in Waterford at that particular time. The glass factory hadn't resurfaced, really you know, after its long. Uh, the, uh, Obliteration, put it like that, uh, and uh, Clover Meats gave uh, a lot too of, of, of work on the far side of the river. Then there was, then there was white people in uh, in O'Connell Street, Madison's. But all those fed into exports and imports, you know, and uh, it was try it appeared to be thriving when I when I joined. But the passenger service uh, was. Really, not quite going into decline, but starting to decline after the war, and as I say, cars and all that started up, and uh, then the ships, uh, they, they could take cars, uh, the car carriers, they came into operation, and they wanted to see a short sea voyage where they could, so Rasselaer then thrived from there on to the sign of, of, of water from that for passengers, so uh, the passenger trade went out of the water all together. And when you started off, what work did you start off doing in there? Well, I, I started off, you know, as a, cli a, a clerk, and then you moved into a custom section because all stuffs from outside of 26 counties had to either have a license uh, or they had paid duty uh, to bring the goods in. And they were accommodated in, in the sheds. Uh, free goods uh, could be uh, put on, on, on the on the quayside covered by tarpaulins, but uh, dutiful goods and wines, whiskies and all those, uh, they certainly had. Um, what started after the war at that time too was fruit coming into the country, because we had practically no fruit for the duration of the war. And, that started, and they used to buy it at the market in Liverpool and uh, bring it over to Waterford. And you had Sunrise Fruit Company, uh, Southern Fruit, uh, you had Willie Welch out in Sleeve Row. Uh, they were all people, earls, they were all people uh, who imported fruit and distributed it here uh, at, at the start. Uh, so we were pretty well cut off, like, you, you know, during the war. And so after that, then, things began to, to come to life, as we say, again. So I was in the customs for that. Uh, duration, I think it was about six years, and I moved into the cash office that dealt with all the accounts then. And I was in that, but uh, there was no action in it, like it was sort of a nine to five job, and uh, I didn't mind it, but uh, I preferred something better. But I was lucky then, I was transferred to the key as the livestock superintendent. 
and uh, that I record, uh, you know, being responsible for the numbers going on because sometimes they had a, an over quota and uh, they couldn't all be accommodated and they had to face the, the shippers and they had big sticks in those days and <laughs> the office for that was over on the quay, it's only removed in the last 10 or 15 years and uh, they'd come in, they'd beat the counter <laughs> and argue in their, their point. Uh, uh, funny enough, there's one, when I, when I was there uh, uh, on one occasion, I had to, uh, it was overbooked and I had to call them all in in the morning and the journalists were fixed anyway. But one man who had been shipping well, but it was based on the week the previous year that you sold the percentage you sold. So, and you got that when it was overbooked. And you had to, but he, he was obviously cut because he was running through a good spell and he argued with me and roared at me all. And he beat the, <laughs> the counter with his stick and he said, if you die tonight, I won't say a prayer for you. <laughs> so I had to stand the ground anyway, and he went off anyway. But about a fortnight after, uh, my first son was born. And the day after, he came into the office and he said, here's a sovereign, he said, for the child. So, you know, their anger subsided once the decision was made. Luckily enough, <laughs> you'd have your head taken off. <laughs> but then I, I was the manifest clerk, and probably was the toughest job of all because you had to manifest every single item that was going on the ship in the outward manifest and you had to get the different rates that all the different goods were, were, uh, were charged at and you had to extend that and the, the, the cost and then such things as customs clearance charges and uh, for the rail charges we had the a rail book that gave you the railway charges in Britain and the price that asked them was you had to make all those up and extend them and do all the tots, 41 lines uh, of work there. It was really tough going on any clerk who got that job. You were drained on the evening afterwards. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, and at the end there was pressure put on because if the captain was waiting for the, the ship to sail before the tides began to ebb, uh, he'd be hooting the horn around you. And you were in the middle of these long tots and you didn't want to get distracted by anything. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, it, was, it was a tough job, but uh, it had to be done by somebody. <laughs> so I was there, so then I, I was made the, the, the key manager in the end when it closed. That's, that's what it was. And the, the building that you moved to, you're doing the, the capital superintendent for that. Okay. Yeah. That's where the plaza is now, or where is it? Uh, yes, yeah, it's the top of the plaza there, on the left hand side of it, it was. It was almost straight over from uh, Henrietta Street. Uh, there, across from Bevan's old bookshop, uh, there at the, at the corner. Uh, it was across there, and also you had to make up the docker's pay. <laughs> my, my, my life's down there uh, and uh, they would be over too in the morning and uh, you'd have to have all that done for them so you know it, it was hard work in some, some departments and uh, but like it was a good atmosphere generally with our colleagues and, and that and uh, so we, we got through it anyway <laughs> and when the day was finished up or when the week was finished up what did you do after? To top mind or to well, I went uh, I went straight away to Cooper's and Lyburn, their accountancy firm there. But uh, you know, other lads had to wait a while. And uh, well, I mean, um, like when you were when you were still working there at the end of each week for socialising or for uh, socialising, we didn't do much. But there was a, a sort of a call we we, we knew it was coming. And uh, we weren't too sure when, like, you know, and uh, the life went out of, of the office naturally when you maybe have one ship in the fortnight or something like that. And uh, then we, we were told uh, the news that uh, we were closing. So we, we were, the, the staff had diminished to about seven, I think, at that, seven or eight at that stage. Uh, so it was, it was a gradual wearing away of, of, of the company in Waterford.
And outside of that, um, can you recall any of the, the entertainment outfits or stuff like that around the city that people would have done in their spare time, in their free time? Oh yeah. Uh, the Olympia was a great place uh, for that at the time. And uh, the big social occasion was the hunt ball and uh, the beagle ball. Uh, in water, and you had to dress up if you wanted to go to that. Um, there were lines of people went there in the streets there just to see the people going in, <laughs> just like film stars. Then <laughs> dress dances were, were so few and far between. And those days, uh, then um, after that, the, the show bands came. The Royal Show Band came. Of course, they were all water the lads and no more, and uh, the place used to be packed. When the, they would, they would be there. Tipper Carlson's or others, and they brought bands over from England. You know, so the, the, the Olympia was, was the social place to meet. Another social place was uh, from uh, in summer evenings, from the uh, clock tower down to Reginald's tower, on to uh, Parnell Street and back up Michael Street, and down to the clock tower again. Uh, that was for walking, <laughs> and uh, it's just hard to believe it now. But like you see, there were bicycles then, but there was little else, and people walked an awful lot in those uh, days. So a lot of summer evenings, boys and girls would walk down, and they'd uh, they'd walk around this walk maybe three or four times before they'd back up up maybe to town uh, and home and. Uh, if there were girls that were, you know, particularly like you changed your journey if they were walking the same way as you, so you would meet into them on the reverse uh, way. Uh, that was, and then there was great uh, church processions too that uh, went out uh, out from the cathedral and out the manor, up Bunkers Hill, across Dial Street, into the Yellow Road and onto Ballybricken. And uh, there was a benediction ceremony and that up there. Because Bally Bricken Hill used to be filled uh, at that time with all, all those. So uh, all those are gone now because of the pace of life and one thing or another. And uh, you know, well, it's good in one way. There are a lot of things lost that, well, won't be regained in our generations anyway. And we don't know how to look into the future. But, uh, Certainly, it was a lot of man-made entertainment. Was the Tremor train was going also at the same time, and we used to get a monthly ticket out there. And uh, a lot of us from school would go out and we'd, uh, get into the carriages. And you see, there were there were unit carriages then. You couldn't walk from one into another. And uh, if you got a carriage, and maybe you had the girls from the schools too, or they are in, and. It was an interesting. We on rainy days we wouldn't get out of Tremor at all. We come in and out and in and out until dinner hour. <laughs> but we used to have sing songs and and things like that. And uh, we used to have great things. But they were all innocent uh, things then. Uh, from the courting couples, Valley Gra Valley, Paddy Brown's Road, Brown's Road. Now was a great one because it was a long road. And they had all stunted gorse bushes and that uh, in it. And uh, the coaching couples were going under it, and there was a sort of a, a bank there uh, out of the ditch, and from usage, it was all fine grass on it. <laughs> and uh, that's where a lot of Walford people did their courting at the time. Uh, there was a, a, one of those confession boxes almost uh, every 10 or 15 yards down the road. But then, of course, when they started building, that all went, you know, and those were, were things in, in, in those days that, uh, you know, got you around. The, the railways were really the only modern, uh, if you like, uh, way of life, of travelling or, or anything like that. They, they had some buses also going to Dublin and, and places, but not, not great services. The, the city service wasn't uh, here now in action in, in Waterford at that time. And if you want to go, go to the the train you got either a small taxi or a jaunting car. They used to have jaunting cars at that time and bring people over. Yeah, what's a jaunting car? Pardon? What's a jaunting car? A jaunting car is a car that people can sit on either side of the animal. It's uh, on top of the, uh, oh, sorry, it's drawn by the uh, the animal on top of and uh, there would be two people on th this side facing out on one of uh, his flanks and 
uh, another two on the other, and the driver would be in the middle, and he, he drove me along. And uh, there was uh, so uh, there was uh, I forget the name of the people who were up at the corner of High Street. Uh, they had uh, several yards in be in behind there in those days. Is there anything else now that you, you want to put me on to? Because uh, I may not have it uh, straight in my head and I might have it in an hour's time <laughs> unless I was asked. <laughs> Do you think so? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little bit dis disappointed with that. I don't know how, how you'd feel with that because I neither was that jetty. And uh, there was a lot of barges that were made originally in the Neptune shipping yard. Uh, and they, they were called hulks then and they had... Uh, sort of way down to them, and, and that's uh, what, where the ships used to dock against until they start building the jetties. Like, so, uh, like uh, when the Clyde were originally formed, it was the old timber toes was only ten years old or something like that. You know, it was the first bridge that was in Waterford. So uh, I went went back through a lot of history. So <laughs> I'm sorry if I didn't give you enough now. There was uh, fantastic. If I had brought my my uh, my spiel with me that I have typed out, I'd have been able to go right through it, yeah. you know, yeah, with you. Been, yeah. But there again, that was done here uh, about a year and a half ago or, or so. Uh, the Foley sisters were down. And it was one of the things that was going on. They had a yeah. festival here. Yeah. So, you know, it's not, at least it's different than that, I suppose. I think you could, well, say, you, know, you could do a whole piece just looking probably on the Clyde alone. Oh yeah you could. And yeah. You could do a huge one just looking at just the ship and alone. Yes. On its own. There's so much to cover. Like oh yeah there's, there's a tremendous uh, say like Malcolmson's now they were probably the biggest shipping company in the world because they bought all they started off in Waterford but they bought into every nearly every shipping company at the, uh, in the world at that time and there was uh, a saying out that uh, the old Mackinson, I forget what his name was at the, at the time, but he was in London for... See, they rebuilt the Parliament building after the Great Fire and uh, in the 1800s. And he was over there and he was talking to the Prime Minister of Britain. And all the ships from all over the world came for this occasion of opening up the House of Commons and, uh, and that. And uh, he was talking to the British uh, thing on, on the bridge there by him. And he said, uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister said, uh, said to him, isn't it a grand sight? Well, he said, it is. He said, there's not one ship in this port, he said, but I haven't an interest in. So that'll show you how strong they were. You know, they lost four million, though, eventually on the Galway to New York to sail at that stage. Like, And uh, that was the beginning of the downfalls, plus the American Civil War, and they were dealing in cotton. The price fell and, and all that. And uh, That's that, what you that, when you then, said that they had a, an interest in the southern side, like the, the oh yeah, in the southern side, big interest in the southern side. And to see, they had the cotton mills out in Port Law, and they used to bring the cotton to it and weave it out there. And um, then the family started bickering with each other and fighting. So <coughs> it went down to the last one that they had. That was the Waterford Steamship Company, that they had an interest in. They didn't own it fully, and. Uh, the Clyde boat. That's how the Clyde came in into Waterford permanently. They used to come in occasionally, like probably had the agents here and that. But uh, then they built their their uh, office up there, which was grand because you could see the whole workings before the sheds were built. Now that was before my time. You, you could see all the workings of the key from the bay window. You know, you hadn't to come across the the road to see what was going on. <laughs> or what wasn't going on, that should have been going on. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I always remember now, I was thinking on myself, I just said it at the last time. Uh, I said, I had to, uh, one day I was to meet three three people in Jordans, and uh, I uh, I went to it, and God, I said they were there sitting on the high stools. And I said, lads, you should have been down in the Rockabilly half an hour ago. You better get out of here. <laughs> you see? So I just finished it up then, the thing, when the slide closed. I said, oh, sad. I will never go in looking for my three friends again on the high stools in Jordans. <laughs> so that sort of rounded it off. But yeah, yeah. 
they, they, they had to work hard though, the dockers, and that's in fairness to them. Yeah, they worked very hard. That's when manual work was manual work. It was work. very hard, yeah. It was very Not hard. And and what, 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 I, uh, what I didn't like, it always was sort of in my craw <laughs> there. That's, uh, they had to come down on the stand. You see, there was no full-time dockers. They had to come down on the stand, and it could be a wettish morning, and they'd come down, and maybe 40 of them would come down, and maybe the stevedore is only picked 31 of them. Yeah, yeah. And the others had to go home, and like, it was a very poor time in Waterford. Then there was nobody hardly rich in yeah. Waterford in those days. And a lot of them came over here in other bars, and yeah. you know, they drank, drank their sorrows, but it, yeah. you know, it was, it was a tough time on them, yeah. It was a tough time on them.